Hi, welcome to our Centro Church online service. We're so glad that you could join us today, whether it's the first time you've watched or whether you're re-watching because you enjoyed the message. Hey, if this is your first time joining us today, there's a little QR code that's coming up on your screen right now. If you could scan that one, there's a new to Centro section or link that you can click and you can fill out your information and one of our team will get in touch with you. There's also a number of other links that you can click to explore as well. We know that you'll be so blessed by our message today and you'll see us again at the end of the service. So why don't we check out today's message? Um, if you have a Bible this morning, we're going to go to the book of Jeremiah. Um, and we don't have a lot of time this morning. We've got, we got, we got another campus we're going to be going to. But I want to preach a message for you today that is really on my heart in this season. And, uh, you know, they say that there are a lot of sermons, but only a few messages. And, and I want to give you today... Uh, what I believe is like just core to what I feel God is wanting me to say, at least to his people in this season, in this season of time that we find ourselves in, of radical change and of, of new, new challenges that we have to face. Uh, and we're going to start reading this morning in Jeremiah chapter 23 and in verse 21. Jeremiah 23 and verse 21. Every word that we're about to, to speak this morning is God speaking straight to his people through the prophet Jeremiah. This is the Lord speaking through Jeremiah. And in verse 21, God says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they run around claiming to speak for me. I have given them no message, yet they go on prophesying. If they had stood before me and listened to me, they would have spoken my words and would have turned my people from their evil ways and deeds. Am I a God who is only close at hand, says the Lord? No, I am far away. At the same time, I am far away at the same time. We've got three verses, and in the first, God makes an observation. In the second, he extends an offering. And in the third, God introduces an understanding in the form of a question. We have an observation an offering, and an understanding. An observation, an offering, and an understanding. Let's read it one more time. I have not sent these prophets, yet they run around claiming to speak for me. I have given them no message, yet they go on prophesying. Turns out a preacher doesn't need unction to fill his mouth with words. If they had stood before me, and listened to me, they would have spoken my words and they would have turned my people from their evil ways and deeds. Here's our key verse for today. God said, am I a God who is only close at hand? Only close at hand, says the Lord. No, I am far away at the same time far away at the same time. Our God said of himself, I am the far away God. Let's pray. Father, in these next few minutes, I pray that you would open your word to us, breathe life, breathe, breathe, breathe spirit. I pray that in this room today, we would sense your presence and your closeness the deep would call unto deep. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Um, several years ago, I was uh, in the nation of Japan, and I was doing a series of one-day conferences across the country. I love Japan. This beautiful, complex, and ancient culture, full of, full of so much energy and life, and the food is amazing, the fashion is amazing, 
The streets are amazing. The trains are amazing. The, the, the abundance of power lines that cross the sky are amazing. It's an awesome country. I love it every time I get to go there. And we were, we were doing a, a series of one-day conferences. So on the first day, we did a conference. We caught, a, we caught an early morning train the next day. We're in Osaka. We did another one-day conference. And then on the third morning, I awoke and we caught an early morning bullet train from Osaka to Tokyo, this incredibly important world city. And when we arrived, we launched into the third of three one-day conferences. It was a large conference for Japan. This is a very, very unchristian country. Literally 0.01% of Japanese people are followers of Christ in a nation of 125 million. But in this auditorium, we had about six or 800 Christians gathered in the room. And I was launching into my sermon, and I've been doing this for a while. 30 years I've been a preacher. And so I'm up there, and I'm preaching. We've been doing this for three days, and I'm preaching my message, and my friend Kirby is translating my message into Japanese. So I'm like, God loves you. And he's like, Katawa. And then I'm like, you know, he's going to change it like, dong, dong, wa, gong, you know. And then, so we're, we're going, and so I'm saying a phrase, and Kirby's saying the phrase, and we're flowing together. I'm caffeinated. He's caffeinated. We're rolling together, and everything felt great. And I'm looking out at the people towards the back of the auditorium, and my perception of my sermon, remember, I've been doing this for a long time, I was giving myself a solid 8.5 out of 10. I thought, John, you are crushing this right now. This is going over really, really well. But as I'm looking out towards the back of the auditorium, suddenly, about five minutes in, my eyes went from the back, and they made their way towards the middle and the front. And the strange thing was happening. As I looked at the middle of the auditorium, about where you all are seated, instead of people engaging me in eye contact, they were looking at the floor. They were looking at the ceiling. They were looking at the wall. They were staring at the phone of the person next to them. Everybody's looking somewhere else but at me. I was bewildered. I was perplexed until finally my eyes made the, themselves all the way to the very front row. And when I found the front row, every hand on the front row was pointed to the left. So I followed the hands and I followed the hands all the way down until over here was a person with an iPad in their hand and written on the iPad, this is what it said, Pastor John's fly <laughs> is completely down. Well, firstly, I think we can all agree we didn't need the word completely in that sentence. <laughs> and here I am in one of the most civilized, you know, you've got to do well, look good nations on the planet. I'm attempting to give glory to the one true God and I'm revealing a glory of a completely different nature. And my perception of me and their perception of me, well, it just could not be more different. And in our passage of Scripture, we've got God talking to us about the prophets. And quickly we see in our reading that God's perception of the prophets and the prophets' perception of themselves, well, it just could not be more different. In verse 21, God literally says about the prophets that they are running around all over the place claiming to speak for me. That these are prophets with full itineraries, with stacked up calendars. When you interact with these prophets and they're talking amongst themselves, they're literally saying, bro, this week I'm in this church, then I've got to go to a conference, we've got a podcast, after that we've got a book deal, a presbytery, then I'm on to the following calendar week. These guys are literally, the Bible says, running around all over the place. They have full calendars, stacked itineraries. They're thinking of themselves as people of great importance. They're running around all over the place. When you meet with them, their, cal their, their playlist is songs like, I'm too Christian for my church, you know? <laughs> I can be your hero, baby, you know? When a leader comes along. These guys literally think that they are all that and the biscuit. Yet when God looks at these prophets, 
he says about them, he says, listen, you may have a stacked calendar, but you have no unction. You have a lot of activity, but there is no anointing. He says about these prophets that they are an empty oracle, that they are a prophet without a voice. It's like being a leader who has no mandate or a follower of Christ who has no living word from God on the inside of them. God literally says, they are running around all over the place claiming to speak for me. But I gave them no message. I gave them nothing to say. God is literally saying about these prophets that they are a, a hollow veneer, that they have replaced effectiveness with busyness. They may be talented, but they are not anointed. They have high action, but they have very little impact. They have religious activity, but there is no corresponding revival, no cut through. And friends, when I read those words, something jumped in my heart because if there is one thing we do not need in the year 2023, it's a lot of religious activity in halls like this one that make no difference in the world that surrounds us. Can anybody agree with me that what we need in our time is a greater voice of the church than just a little bit of hoopla in, a tor in an auditorium. Man, we need cut through. We need an awakening. We need revival. We need the power of God to be made manifest. We need a broken world to find the healer. And if you believe that, give me a little bit of an amen out there. Honestly, I think if our spirituality can get reduced down to just something that we do in an auditorium on a Sunday, but doesn't make a difference in the world that surrounds us, I think the devil is fine with it. And so we look at these prophets and they are the epitome of this kind of Christianity, running around all over the place claiming to speak for me. But I gave them no message. They have nothing to say. And as a result, nothing is happening as a result of their ministry. That, that is God's observation. But then we find about our loving Savior that He extends an offering. He says, if they would stand before me. Oh, don't you love that, friends? God doesn't look at the wayward prophet and say, you are banished to the wilderness. God looks at the wayward prophet and he says, return to the one who can fill you with unction. He doesn't say you are forever gonna be on the sidelines. He says, if you will come back to me, I will fill you again. And the God that we worship says to each and every one of his kids, come close to me, stand before me. Let me speak to you. Let me show you who I am. If you would stand before me, if you would listen to me, God offers intimacy. God offers a message. God does not desire a prophet without unction. He does not desire a Christian without a living relationship. God wants his people living with a faith promise alive on the inside of them. And he invites us to return no matter how long. Maybe you're in this auditorium today and it's been a long time since you've ever connected with your God. And God says to each and every person who feels adrift or afar off from him, he says, come close to me again. I am the God who welcomes you. Come, come in your hour of need. Come whether you feel worthy. Come to how long, no matter how long it's been since you've stood in my presence. I welcome all to come close to me. And then he says, if they, then they. If they would stand in my presence, then they would proclaim my words. And God literally highlights for these prophets. You do not have to expend yourselves in fruitless activity. You don't have to fake it while on the inside you know that you're not making it. You can stand before me and a different outcome is possible. God is trying to say to us, church, things can change. We do not have to accept the status quo of the drift of our world and say that's always the way it's going to be. Yeah. Does anybody in this room still believe that a Christian with the Word of God in their heart can bring change to situations? Come on, if you believe it, put your hands together and let's give God a mighty clap of praise. We can see revival. We can see the glory of the, of the Lord cover the earth as the water.
waters cover the sea. We can see an awakening. The lost can return. Addictions can be broken. Marriages can be restored. Communities can be made whole. Lives can be changed. Young people can come to Christ. The church can be built. God can move. If you believe it, give me a hearty amen in this auditorium today. He makes an observation. He extends an offering. And then God introduces an understanding in the form of a question. A question. A question. It's been my experience of following God that often I come to Him thinking that He's the God with all the right answers. And I discover of Him the more I follow Him that often He's the God with all the right questions. Who told you that you were naked? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Finding a man who'd been sitting beside a well for 37 years, Jesus said to him, do you want to be made well? Are you ready to take the reins of your life back? Be responsible for how you'll feed yourself tomorrow. Do you want to be made well? Question, question. So God asks the prophets a question. He says in our passage of scripture, he says, am I a God who is only close at hand? Only close at hand. Is that the sum total of what may be known of me? Is that all you could ever say of me? All that can be discovered of me? Am I a God who is only close at hand? Is that it? And then he answers his own question. He says, no, I am far away at the same time. Far away. Far away at the same time. I have some friends who are going to help me preach this, some, some amazing Centro Church men. Can you give them a big clap as they come and take the stage? This manly group of men. Come on, keep clapping. They're doing a wonderful job. Let's thank the Lord for them. As they're taking the, the platform this morning, let me just begin to illustrate what they're about to, to highlight for us. And that is that we, we live in a time in, in this moment of history of radical change, where the world that existed only a generation ago now seems strangely foreign when we look at the world in which we now live. Ours is the age of close at hand. We live in a time of connectedness, of online activity, of multitasking, a time of busyness and a time of pressure. It used to be that there was a life that we lived that was close at hand, and then everything else in our lives was at a distance from us. I remember when I started my very first job that in order to do my job, I had to drive to the city of Auckland to begin the working day, and when I left for the day, my job was over. That's not the life we live now. The life we live now, you can wake at five in the morning and discover that your supervisor got triggered during the night and they sent you three emails. And when you wake up in the morning and turn your phone off of sleep mode or flight mode, immediately stress filled emails from your boss start flooding into your present reality. Your job used to be far off, but now it's close at hand. And when I was a teenager, I lived my life. I was aware of my five friends and my high school, and that was all I really knew about, and everything else was a long distance away from me. But now, because of the curse, I mean, the blessing of social media, now I can be living my life, and I'm aware of my life, but also your life. And I've got my reality, and I'm comparing it to your airbrush projection. And so I'm living in my challenges Perplexing. I'm living in the, the confusion and the, the issues of my present day. But while I'm living that, I'm also seeing what you are presenting to the world of what you're going through. And there's influences and there's other people. And now everything that's happening in the world that used to be at a distance is close at hand. And, and there's always been tragedy in the world. 
always been tsunamis, disasters, earthquakes, famines, wars, economic recessions. There's always been ups and downs and highs and lows. But now we've got dedicated news channels that want to arrest our attention. And so from the moment you wake till the moment you go to sleep at night, in order to get you to actually view a small piece of advertising, the worst events of the world are being rammed down your throat on your phone, on a television, they're in the cafe, they're in the airport, they're in they're in the shopping mall. Every week you go, news is being thrust at you. The worst tragedies of the world have always been taking place, but now they are close at hand. We're living lives of 24-7 pressure. Of, 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 we're living in an age where your attention is the most valued commodity in the world right now. Nothing is more valuable than being able to get you to stare at something for literally only one or two seconds. If I could guarantee a way that I could get your attention guaranteed for two seconds, I would be a multi-billionaire, if not a trillionaire, if I could guarantee that I could get your attention. When we commoditize the attention of a generation, we live lives, if we're not careful, of very superficial distraction. Where everything that is in the world is now close at hand. It's close at hand. It's close at hand. It's busy. It's pressured. And we're not coping. I mean, it used to be that you left your job and you had the whole commute from wherever your job was to your family meal table to detox from this and prepare yourself for this. Now, you schedule three phone calls to be made as you're leaving central Brisbane and driving back to your home in the suburbs. And as you're making your way, you get off the last phone call, perhaps negotiating a deal. Maybe something was broken. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was a conflict. And you hang up the phone and you walk to your meal table and you're trying to be a good family member, a good friend to those that are around you because the pressures of life are constant and it's all just close at hand. And we're wigging out. I mean, as a generation, we are the most depressed, stressed out, anxious, suicidal generation that has ever walked the face of the earth. Because all the pressure of life is no longer at a distance to us, it's all just close at hand. Now, before we wallow in depression, there is one thing that I'm grateful of, my friends, and that is no matter what I face in my life, no matter how great the storm, no matter how triggering the anxiety, no matter how real the rejection might seem or how, how great the pressure might come around us in any moment or storm that we might face in our lives, I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that no matter what I face, my God is close at hand. That God literally says of Himself, I am a God who is close at hand. And I don't know about you, I'm grateful that when I feel anxious from the emails from my boss, I can pray and His peace can transcend my anxiety. I'm grateful that His love can take the place of my rejection. I'm glad that He is the Prince of Peace in my life, even though I have no solutions to the problem. His peace is greater than the storm that I am in. He is the God of constancy, the God of love, the God of assurance, the God of hope, the God of peace, the God of comfort. And if you're grateful for Him, go ahead, put your hands together, and let's thank and honor our close at hand God. He's close at hand. He's close at hand. He's there for me when I'm stressed and He's there for me when I'm anxious and He comforts me in the hustle and He's there for me no matter how dark the night. And if all I have is just a, a New York minute as I hop out of my car and I make my way to the family meal table to say, Jesus, help me to step out of my job and into the role of being the husband and father that I want to be. God will hear my prayers and He helps and He cares and He comforts. And if you believe that, give Him some praise in this room today. He's a close at hand God. He's a close at hand God. He's a close at hand God and He's full of comfort and He's full of love and He's He's amazing, isn't he? I'm so grateful for his day-by-day, moment-by-moment reality of his love and his peace and his presence in my life, aren't you? Yeah, but to the prophets who are running around all over, them, all over the place, God, God highlights something. He says to them, 
Am I a God who is only close at hand? Is that it? Because in the constancy of these prophets' hustle, they're busy with appointments, but they're low on true unction. Something is missing from these anointed men of God's expressions of faith. Something is missing from their ministry that means that people that they're supposed to be speaking to are not getting what they need. And a generation is not turning to the Lord. Instead, they're clinging to their evil ways. And to these prophets, God asked the question, is there more to me than what you can experience in just the constancy of your hustle? And then he says, yes, there is. Yes, there is. Am I a God who is only close at hand? No. I'm far away at the same time. I'm far away at the same time. He's saying, there's some parts of me that you're never going to find if you only interact with me in the middle of what is close at hand. At times, in order to get what I want to give you, there's going to need to be moments when you push back, to stand flat if, if you can, guys, when you have to push back on all in your life that is close at hand, when you have to switch off the smartphone, when you have to disconnect from the hustle, when you have to unsubscribe from the constancy of the pressure that is in your world, and you have to, have to turn your gaze completely towards the God who is far away, where we have to literally give God not just our little interactions in the middle of a distracted life, but we have to turn aside to the God who is on the top of the mountains, the God who is afar off, the God who demands that we reach for Him, the God who looks for our worship, the God who looks for our adoration, The God who said, I am there for you when you search for me, even during the second and the third watch of the night. In other words, while everybody else is asleep, there's a peculiar window where we can find increased intimacy, not with the close at hand God, but with the far away God. Come on, is there anybody in this room who's ever put your final child to bed for the night and as you've made your way towards the remote control in your lounge room, have just felt the whisper of heaven? Like, don't turn on the TV right now. Put on some worship music. Sit in a chair. Can anybody say with me that what you're experiencing in that moment is the faraway God just fluttering in your chest? telling you that God is wanting to call for you, wanting to put a word on the inside of you, desiring to fill you and meet with you. God is literally saying to these prophets, you're in the middle of all of this close at hand activity and you're going for it constantly, yet you're only just keeping yourselves at zero. What I wanna put in you is gonna be so substantial that it's going to change the way that you interact with all of this close at hand stuff. And you're going to get that when you reach for the God who is far away. See, friends, in our generation, what we need right now more than we've ever needed it before is not just the close at hand God, we need the far away God. It's the far away God that Moses discovered when he turned aside to see a bush that was burning but did not burn up. And the bush, the God spoke to him from the bush and said, take off your shoes for the place where you're standing is holy. It's the faraway God that Isaiah found when he was standing in the temple on the Lord's day in the office of a prophet. And as as Pastor Catherine kept singing this morning, and that's why I know that this word is from the Lord, she kept crying, holy, holy, because the Bible says that the train of his robe filled the temple with glory and seraphim circled the throne, sorry, circled the throne in the temple. And they cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah Isaiah fell to his face, a prophet, and he said, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord God Almighty. The God Isaiah encountered that day was not the close at hand God, it was the faraway God. It's the faraway God that Saul encountered when he was going down that Damascus road and his life changed direction. It's the faraway God who comes to us in moments of adoration, surrender, worship, 
and fills us with such divine reality that our lives are never the same again. It's the faraway God who commissions us. It's the faraway God who fills our lives with vision. It's the faraway God who awakens us to the potential of the world. It's the faraway God who puts a promise in your heart. It's the faraway God who breathes upon you and gives you the promise of revival. And you can never live a lowly life again. It's the faraway God who ruins you for the ordinary. It's the faraway God our world desperately needs. It's the faraway God whose commissioning comes to us and awakens us. And suddenly we realize that there is so much more than we've ever seen before. It's the faraway God that Jacob discovered when he lay down to sleep one night as the third of of a faith generation. Abraham was his grandfather, Isaac was his father, and Jacob awoke during the night having had a vision and he said, God is in this place and I was not aware of it. It's not the close at hand God that Jacob discovered that night. The God at the top of that ladder was the faraway God. So gather around me, friends. Gather around me. Gather around me nice and tight. So I have a concern. I have a concern for our generation, and this is what it is. That of all we know, how many people would be honest enough to say like me that sometimes you're trying to do your devotions from your smartphone, right? And before you're five verses deep into your, into your devotions, already you've got three text messages and your favorite app for shopping on has just come up with a 30% off online only sale starting right now. And you're only five verses deep in your quiet time. Come on, can you honestly just put a, yeah, say, that's happened to me, three honest people and a lot of lying Christians in this room today. <laughs> If we're interacting with God only in this distracted, close at hand state, in the close at hand is how we discover God's mercy and His kindness. In the close at hand is when I discover God's faithfulness. When my child is sick in hospital, I need a close at hand God. When my business looks like it's going under, I need a close at hand God. But God literally says, I'm more than that. Because in the close at hand, we might discover His mercy and His faithfulness, but it's only the faraway God who can commission your life for a divine purpose. The close at hand God can keep you going through the pressure that you're in the middle of, but it's the faraway God who fills your life with vision greater than the experience of pressure you're now facing. The close at hand God is going to fill you with His grace, but it's the faraway God who fills you with His Word and with His fire. And if there is something we need more than we've ever needed before, it's a generation who've done more than just interacted with a distracted Christian experience. We need a generation who've touched the far away God. See, I, I have a concern. I have a concern. My concern is, that if all we know is the close at hand God, then this alters the expectations that we have of Him and therefore the way that we represent Him. Yeah. Listen to the songs of worship that are being written in many of our churches. I'm walking into churches all over the world and finding that Christians don't even want to praise anymore. Like we just like to skip the praise songs because the praise songs don't make me feel good. That's right. You enter his courts with thanksgiving. You enter his gates with praise. I don't, I don't give thanksgiving because it's good for me, although it is, but I give it because it's good for him. It's how I prepare my heart to align with his presence. Can I get an amen? That's what we're called to do. But we, we have a generation that don't want to do this. And then we sing songs of worship. And has anybody noticed that increasingly the central narrative of songs of worship seem to be us. God loves me. He cares for me. He will make a way for me. He's there for me. He loves me. Me, 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 me. The seraphim don't circle the throne of heaven singing God loves me. It's true, and there should be some songs that we sing that declare it because some broken person needs to hear it, but they've been circling the throne of heaven for millennium of human history singing the same refrain, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty and the whole earth is full of His glory. They're not talking about the close at hand God. They're talking about the far away God. The far away God awakens you fills you with purpose and vision and life and energy. 
push back against the, the stage, my friends. You can stay. The faraway God is experienced by the one who turns aside to see the burning bush. By the, one, by the one like Elijah who'll climb the mountain to hear the whisper. The faraway God is found by the one like Moses who pitched the tent outside the camp where he left everything that was close behind and just Moses and a tent and the voice of his God. The faraway God is found by the one with no cell phone in hand during worship. The one who even leaves their cell phone in their car to come to church. How many people even in this message have checked a text message or posted on social media even in the 30 minutes that we're trying to connect with God? The faraway God can't be found by a distracted mind, can't be found by an over-occupied soul. That's why we climb to meet Him. We empty ourselves of everything that we are to find everything of who He is. But when the faraway God whispers, Miracles are born. Revivals are placed in souls. Lives are ruined for the ordinary. Miracles begin to take place. What our generation needs, like it's never needed anything before, is not just the God who is close at hand. We need to rediscover again what it means. Anybody old enough to remember the word tarry? T-A-R-R-Y, tarry. Charles Finney invented the word. It means, well, iconized the word. It means, it means to wait with expectation until. Wait with expectation until. Can we, can we, can we build a generation in the church who aren't just opening their eyes and dropping their hands the moment the worship song doesn't have lyrics on the screen? Can we build a generation in the church of genuine hunger for God? Passion and a desire. A generation to reach the faraway God. Thank you very much to my friends. Can you give them a clap as they leave the clap room today? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Stand to your feet together with me, church. Our, our time is done. Pray that you'll join us at one of our live services next week, either at 5 Pring Street, Ipswich at 9am or 5pm, or at our Collingwood Park location at Woodlink State School at 10am. Blessings from our senior pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Catherine Spark, and all of the team here at St.